Now, am I audible? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amjad, for joining us. Uh, can I uh, introduce you uh, now? Would you like to start your talk now or would you like to wait for the next five minutes so that we can start? Uh, as you like. Okay. So uh, usually we have around 40, 50 participants and um, rest of the participants are from the other sides of the world. So the format is in English and uh, usually uh, after the end of the lecture or the talk, the question and answer session is taken. So uh, let me uh, have the pleasure of uh, uh, in introducing Dr. Amjad Ali, who is an FCPS uh, and MCPS consultant. He has done his fellowship in cardiac anesthesia from Malaysia. He's also the professor and current head of the department in Bolan Medical College, Quetta. Um, and I'm really grateful to Dr. Amjad Ali for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. Please, um, you can start your talk now. Dr. Amjad, am I audible? So we are waiting for five minutes. Or just we have to start it. No, you can start. The rest of the people would be joining okay. us in between. Okay. Thank you for your nice introduction. Actually, we are today talking about a very uh, complex topic. So, uh, because there are wide variety of the diseases which are related with this uh, bariatric surgery. So. This is actually the agenda which we are going to cover today. That is introduction. And we have to just uh, uh, give brief uh, definition of obesity and then what are the common causes of the obesity and what are the managements actually today nowadays we are offering to these patients. And then the problems which are associated with bariatric surgery. And what are the anesthetic considerations when we are treating these patients or we are delivering anesthesia to these patients? And according to the WHO, the prevalence of obesity has significantly increased since 1975 and approximately 40 years. And now it is approximately 30% of the world's population actually are going to be obese. And obesity is now a global epidemic and a common order. So this actually uh, is also giving the anesthesia a very big challenge that how they can anesthetize these patients. So more than 650 million obese adults worldwide are increased. And surprisingly, the obese people or the population is more in developing countries rather than in developed countries. So when, how we quantify the obesity? Actually, initially we have started with the BMI. Although with the BMI, there are many flaws in it because the BMI is only giving the, and what is the BMI? BMI is the weight in kg, then we divide that with the square of height that is in meters. So there are some flaws, but because of simplicity, still we are using the BMI. And this is the classification of the BMI. So under the weight is less than 18.5 kg per meter square and normal is around 18.5 to 25. And overweight is around less than 30. So class one, class two, and class three. So the class three is the morbidly obese, which is more than 40. So now actually the NICE guidelines, they have come up with the uh, now, recommendations that we should not only consider the BMI for classification of the obesity and obesity related complications. Now, they have also incorporated the waist circumference. So, waist circumference and the BMI, they combine, then they determine and their validity actually increase. So, for the men, desirable is actually 95, but uh, Less than 102 centimeter is okay for the men and less than 88 for the female. 
and it is not only necessary that BMI and uh, circumference of the waist because there are now two types of OVST. One actually commonly we use as apple and second we commonly say pear shape and which is the gonochoid OVST or peripheral. So most important is for us as an aesthetist is the central OVST because this is the central OVST which is more associated with the myriads of different concomitant diseases. And why this uh, obesity is? Because there is an imbalance of energy intake and the expenditure. So we are, by the foods and by different things, we are taking more energy, but on the other side, the expenditure is less. So that extra expenditure, extra energy is actually stored in our body as a fat. So these are the different factors and different contributing factors actually which cause the obesity. So basically this is the imbalance of energy intake and energy expenditure. So biological factors are there and genes. Actually they have identified many genes which are also related to environmental and the behavioral. Like nowadays we are more going for junk foods and that's why even the obesity is also very much increasing in the pediatric age group. Actually, this is the pathophysiology. Briefly, I'm touching it. It's also a very complex relation that how this fat accumulation is there and this fat accumulation then further deteriorate in the uh, causing different abnormalities and different uh, broad spectrum of the diseases which are causing these uh, uh, to the obese patients. So how this uh, fat accumulation is, you can see that fat is accumulated and low energy expenditure. We are not burning this fat. And then this fat is going to also, it's a pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these are the <clears throat> inflammatory cytokines which are further worsen the conditions because what are the conditions like insulin resistance, leptin resistance, lipotoxicity, dyslipidemia, fibrogenesis, and pancreatic B cell deficiency. And this is actually the simple overweight. If it is not encountered initially, then it can convert into a morbidly obese patient. Again, this is the pathophysiology that how normal, actually this is the adipocytes, and initially what happens, these adipocytes actually, they are And if it is not properly managed, then there is like a BMI of more than 40, then what happens that also they actually grow not in all its size, but they also grow in numbers. And these are the actual pathophysiological events which are happened. Like with inflammation, increase of lipolysis, insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, and the recruitment of macrophages and death of adipocytes, apoxemia, and oxidative stress, and all these causes the different diseases which will again we see and which are also giving us a lot of challenges for giving the anesthesia to these patients. Mm -hmm. So these are actually uh, just uh, briefly that which actually systems or organs are involved with the obesity. So obesity means not a simple, a single drug, uh, disease, but actually it is a myriad of concomitant diseases which it is producing, like starting from the high blood pressure, liver disease, heart disease, GRD, type 2 diabetes mellitus, cancer, and high cholesterol, and also psychological actually things are also happened, like mood changes, because it's also a stigma. And most of the, these people, that's why they are more sedentary lifestyle, because they cannot go out just because of their personality stigmas. So this slide is also it's a very congested slide, but actually this is showing that how all the organs are involved and in what level they are actually affected. So start from the like CNS. In CNS, they have started with the major depression, bipolar disorders, and same times, if you go for the CVS, in CVS is the hypertension, uh, coronary artery diseases, MI, and also cardiac failure, and cardiac failure also, it includes the diastolic dysfunction and systolic function together, and also there are arrhythmias. 
So in diabetes, these patients mostly they like around 60 to 70 percent of the these patients develop diabetes type 2, and also dyslipidemia is there. Metabolic syndrome again. This is a uh, this is the condition which is associated with the obesity, hypercoagulability, and non-alcoholic actually state appetitis because of fatty liver. And AKI is also associated with the obesity. So on the other side, actually, these are the signs symptoms of the same systems which are involved in the obesity. So what are the obesity treatment? Initially, obesity actually is the prevention and diet, exercise, behavior, modification, drug therapy, and there are nowadays specific drugs. Actually, they are not that much promising, and maybe they are not for even the uh, uh, obesity, which are uh, like morbidly obese, are the BMIs more than 30 and 35. So the only thing and now only solution we are facing is gastric surgery. So today we are talking about this gastric surgery, that how this gastric surgery is actually going to be performed and for how we have to prepare the patients for performing these surgeries. Actually, these are the nice clinical guidelines that what are the recommendations for the surgery. Initially, they have just put that any patient who is with the BMI of more than 40 should go for these surgeries. But now they have some modification for these indications and these modifications are like if the BMI is more than 35 and with the same time, they have some comorbids. Like uh, they have some uh, with a cardiac disease or they have a type 2 diabetes mellitus and any other problem. So we can go uh, with the BMI of even 30, more than 35 for these surgeries. As these surgeries are uh, offering a good solution for the other problems rather than obesity per se. So uh, just uh, uh, briefly about the surgeries, which actually then for these uh, patients, there are two types of surgeries we do. One is the actually, we, we, which we call the male absorptive surgeries and second is the restrictive. In the male is the absorptive, actually we bypass the areas where the most of the nutrition are absorbed. And in the restrictive, actually we are also limiting the reservoir of the stomach to a level that patient should not eat more. So we will talk about these procedures. So nowadays, all the procedures are done laparoscopically, but in the laparoscopy, again, robotic surgery is again in coming in a vogue and is in the fashion that many centers, not only in the, still in, not in Pakistan, but outside, they are doing this robotic surgeries for the, this is uh, gastric surgeries. So the first is the gastric banding. Actually, the gastric band is a short procedure that requires minimum analgesia. It also involves the placement of a subcutaneous injection board, often over the ZP sternum. So uh, you can see from this diagram that actually they put a small band over the proximal part of the stomach. So they will just make a extra pouch and this pouch is actually accumulating the food. So whenever we feed the patient, when feed a little of the food, then the signals actually go to the brain that the stomach is full, so you have to stop the feeding. And this is actually adjustable, so we can adjust it because this is the area where we can uh, put the saline by increasing size of the gastric banding or this band. So we can decrease and increase the gastric band. Although uh, 10 years back, it was the most popular procedure, although nowadays it is not that much popular, the popularity is dropped. So why the popularity dropped? Because this is the reason that uh, least amount of excess weight loss, actually, it is related with this. And the benefit of diabetes was not that much, which is desired by the physicians, or it was desired that the uh, level of diabetes should be controlled. So that's why this is not very uh, commonly or very <clears throat> frequently done. But although this is a very good because it is a less invasive than the other, because this can be reversed. The second is the gastric balloon. 
Nowadays, also, they are putting a gastric balloon. Actually, it's not a surgery. They endoscopically put this gastric balloon inside the stomach. So the only purpose is only to decrease the size of the stomach. And this balloon, actually, they put uh, namasalan in this uh, balloon. And this balloon, again, it can be adjustable, but it is uh, only for the short-term uh, management, not for the long-term management. And again, there are some uh, pitfalls with this. Like the weight loss is not as uh, it is desired. So these are the problems with this. Uh, but benefits are, again, because it's a simple and safe procedure. And on the daycare, properly, they do it. And uh, maybe the, with the BMI of like 30 to 40, it is more favorable and more suitable as compared to the most uh, invasive surgical procedures. Actually, this is the gastric bypass. Here you can see that it is also called row and uh, procedure. Here, actually, the distal jejunum is attached to the proximal stomach. And then the distal stomach is actually, it is disconnected from the main portion. And now they have make a very small pouch. And this is a type of malabsorptive surgeries because this all area is now bypassed. So with this bypassing, so many nutritions are many uh, uh, like carbohydrates or eye feed, they cannot be absorbed. So this is an example of, uh, this is the malabsorptive surgery. This surgery is bore invasive and the duration of the surgery is again very prolonged, like more than two to four hours it takes uh, approximately. Although the weight loss is very much high, like it is 70 to 80 percent, so most of the medical problems which uh, developed by uh, are related to the obesity, so they can be managed by the, this procedure. And especially for the diabetic patients and even the, for long-term uh, KO, because many people, they uh, do the surgeries and after a few years, again, they uh, get the same weight. So in this, actually, they have a long-term uh, treatment of the obesity. The problems, again, are the, uh, because it's the longest operation and the complications are more so, the anatomy is deranged of, and some of the nutrients, because it's a malabsorptive, and some of the essential nutrients are also deficient, so patients should have supplemental nutrition for that. The most commonly, which nowadays are doing, that is the sleeve gastrectomy. Actually, in the sleeve gastrectomy, they also they take the only they keep the only twenty percent of this portion, and rest of the portion is actually excised. So, with this portion, the people who are getting uh, food again, this is a very small pouch, and the signals which are again sending to the brain that uh, even with the early satiety. So that is again restrict their food intake. Again, this is not reversible. This is a, a complication for this and risk of weight again, stretching of the sleeve because although this is only 20%, but with the habit of the, if the person is are eating more, so this can again stretch. So weight gain can be gained. So, and again, the other problems are the heartburn and it's a, actually a new procedure, but nowadays it's most common is the sleeve gastrectomy and about 60 to 80 percent of the procedures are by sleeve gastrectomy. Gastric bending is now replaced by the sleeve gastrectomy. So how we manage actually these patients? Because these patients, we have talked about the obesity and we have talked about the procedures which we are going to do for bariatric surgeries. So how we can now anesthetize these patients because as I mentioned that these are the myriad of diseases and many broad spectrum, not only uh, medical, but also surgical problems are there. So we have to manage these patients accordingly. So preoperative assessment, actually the type of surgery, this is very important. As I mentioned, there are four types of surgery. Some of them are minimal invasive and some of them are uh, more invasive and second sometimes it is done laparoscopically sometimes robot is involved and sometimes they can do it openly and now the comorbid whether patient has cardiac disease and uh, congestive heart failure 
and the presence of cerebrovascular disease, history of insulin use preoperatively, and plasma creatinine levels more than two. So these are all important because they always predict the postoperative course. So these are the disorders which are by the obesity because lung volumes, again, these lung volumes are also decreased. Gas exchange, there is a, uh, also impairment of the gas exchange, lung compliance and airway resistance because more obese, they have a lot of fat around the thorax. So this also limits and they have restrictive lung diseases. And the most other problems are obstructive sleep apnea and obesity, hyperventilation syndrome. So these are all associated with the respiratory disorders. So we have to take a proper history of shortness of breath and SpO2, we should check. It should not be less than 95% of room air. Actually, stop bank, this is the criteria which we are uh, scoring for the obstetric sleep apnea. We will just in the next uh, slide, we will discuss it. And if the uh, this is the obesity, uh, upper body syndrome, we have to take the history of this. Like if there's a BMI of more than 30, upper capnia when awake, raised, bicarbonate because uh, when the patient is retaining the CO2, so the bicar will compensatory increase. So this is also predict the uh, severity of the people or the patients who are getting this uh, respiratory problems, apoxemia and apoventilation. In cardiovascular, we have to take the history and examine for the hypertension, left ventricular apotrophy, left ventricular failure and conduction abnormalities and cardiomyopathy. Some of the, actually these problems are not directly related to obesity, but some are because obesity also causes the diabetes mellitus. So diabetes mellitus is also involved in deranging other systems. Like if the left ventricular apotrophy, this may be a cardiomyopathy, may be because of diabetic cardiomyopathy. So one is the disease itself and second, the secondary diseases which are developed by the obesity. So all these involved, so we have to be carefully uh, take the history and carefully investigate these patients. So again, right alpha pulmonary hypertension also because of restrictive pulmonary diseases. So this can be a, on the right heart failure is there. So this is also due to polycythemia, these patients have uh, because of apoxemia, they have a secondary polycythemia and they have because obstructive sleep apnea again causes polycythemia. So these are the important that we should know the uh, PBC of these patients that whether their pexel volume is low or high. And second, that functional capacity is very difficult to ascertain because we need at least more than two, uh, four METs and METs is a metabolic equivalence and this is actually we uh, score the, for the functionality of the patients. But in these patients, because they are sedentary lifestyle and because of obesity and obesity, uh, they have the musculoskeletal system problems secondary to obesity. So they, uh, the uh, functional classification is very difficult to ask because they are most of them immovable. These are the problems which are caused with the GIT. So in GIT, the most important is the involvement of the liver. So GID is there, but liver, liver infiltration is there. And because we know that all the physiology, all the drugs, they are metabolized by the liver. So we have also altered uh, drug metabolism and also altered other hormone synthesis at the same time. So how we do the uh, pre-initial assessment, we have to assess the coronary disease, obstructive sleep apnea, pulmonary hypertension, dyspnea on exertion, uh, especially ask for fatigue, orthopnea, and syncope. So we have to the, uh, do the ECG for left ventricle and right ventricle apotrophy, chest X-ray. So actually this is a, sometimes we are not doing all these uh, uh, specific test for these patients because it is not necessary that all patients have the same diseases. So we have to be particular and we have to specific uh, about the history taking and then the examination and the investigations. We should not do all the investigations for all patients. So it is a only selection of the patient and selected patients should have the special investigations. So these patients who are coming for anesthesia, they should have 
many uh, pre-medication or uh, many uh, drugs which should be given pre-operatively uh, to these patients. And most of, as I mentioned, that these patients, they have a, uh, also the immunity is low. And they are very much prone for the infections post-operatively. So we have to give them prophylaxis uh, antibiotics and especially cefazolin is the antibiotic which is commonly used for normal patients. We use two grams of cefazolin, but because for these patients and the volume of distribution of the drug is also large. So that's why we are giving three grams of the cefazolin for these patients. And we have to also give dexamethasone combined with ordenstrol and aliprodol. It is only to prophylactically give uh, for the prevention of the post-operative nausea vomiting because these patients are more prone for the post-operative nausea vomiting. So we have to manage these patients preoperatively by giving this triple combination and triple regime. Pregabalin and gabapentin nowadays, it is actually giving for the post-operative pain management as we know that these patients are also prone for the obstetric sleep apnea. So post-operatively, they may have uh, low uh, oxygen and they may uh, have like their awakeness is not that much uh, uh, good. So that's why we have to, whether we to avoid the uh, opiates or we should reduce the dose of the opiates. So we have to give pregabalin or gabapentin. It is just to adjust the pain management. Okay, so we uh, oral administration of benzodiazepines, this is again controversial. Many people, they say that Benzodiazepines are not good as a uh, pre-medicate because these patients are already on the OSA. But uh, many of them say that because they are very much an uh, anxious, so oral administration of benzodiazepines can be given. And the last and not the least is the thromboembolic uh, actually prevention. These people are very much prone for the uh, DVT and DVT second uh, can go for the uh, pulmonary embolism and other things. So that's why we have to give them uh, prevention for the, uh, pre, pre, uh, this uh, embolism. So there are actually many regimes for that. Maybe uh, these are mechanical or pharmacological. So in mechanical, we have the stockings or intermittent pneumatic uh, devices are there. And for the pharma pharmacological, we have the uh, heparin that is unfractionated or lower uh, low molecular weight heparin. So what are the actions which are needed for these patients before going for surgery? So ABG initially, again, ABG is not for all and it's not routine, but if the patient is giving any history of uh, uh, severe pulmonary impairment or OSA or any other OHS, so these patients should have ABG initially to just quantify their severity of their respiratory problem. Spirometry, again, because as mentioned that these are, uh, the pattern is res uh, restrictive lung diseases. So we have to do the spirometry, CPAT, like this uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, because uh, we cannot uh, take from the functional classification is difficult for these patients. So we go for the CPAT, but again, this is not for all the patients. So airway planning before increased risk of difficult intubation and difficult mask ventilation, refer to further investigation and treatment and common CPAP before surgery and continue after surgery. Again, this is for selective patients. It is not for all patients, but for morbidly obese patients and the patients who are giving history of OSA. So we can give the CPAP before the surgery. So this is also for pre habilitation of the patients. So this is also important for that. So if it is not uh, educated, then we can use the BiPAP. And the most important from the pre-operative assessment, we should always predict their post-operative course and post-operative outcome. So we have to plan and we have to be prepared for that, that what would be the plan of this patients. As I mentioned that some of the procedures also doing on the daycare uh, uh, surgeries. So we have to also know that which patient is going for daycare and which patient cannot go for the daycare procedure. So we beforehand, we should know the assessment these patients. So obstetric sleep apnea, is, which is very much associated with these patients, is defined as cessation of breathing during sleep for periods of lasting longer than 10 seconds. Changes that include arterial apoxemia and upper caribia 
polycythemia, systemic hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, and right ventricle dysfunction. So actually, these are the characteristics of OSA. And this is the stop bank questionnaire. And this stop bank questionnaire is very important. And it is also, also giving a replacement for the sleep studies. Because if the patient is giving history of OSA, like because we are also, we should also see our ground realities. That how many hospitals they have sleep studies. So that's why this uh, stop bank questionnaire is very important. Plethysmography is again indicated for those patients, but if we are not having it because that's more expensive and many hospitals, they don't have this facility. So stop bank, we have to be more actually rely on this stop bank questionnaire. This questionnaire also have this uh, uh, around seven uh, parameters, like stop is snoring, tiredness observed, and then bank is BMI more than 35, age more than 50, neck circumference more than 40 centimeter and gender. And it's a very highly validation for the post-operative complications. So we can easily rely on this questionnaire and any people, their scoring is more than 30. So we have to prepare that these patients may end up in uh, HDU or ICU after the surgeries and after the procedures. So this is the risk stratification. This is specially risk OS, MRS. This is for uh, this obesity, surgical risk, uh, mortality risk uh, scoring. And again, this has five parameters like arterial hypertension is there, age more than 45 years, male gender, BMI more than 50. So, and the risk factors for pulmonary hypertension is one. So these are important and the persons are the patients who have a score of four to five. These are very high risk patients and we have to prepare for these patients. Again, these patients also give an indication that we have to arrange ICU for the post-operative management of these patients. So these risk stratifications are very important. Although these are on the clinical side, they don't need more sophisticated investigations. So all these procedures and all these conditions which are associated with the patients, so the patient should go only when we have optimized all the medical situation and medical conditions of these patients like from the cardiac, from the respiratory, diabetes, the, uh, the embolism risk, and also the OSA. So all these should be optimized be before the surgery. And nowadays in many of the centers, actually they also have a program for the prehabilitation. They actually book the patient after one month for the surgery because these are the elective procedures. So they can wait for that. So they, what they do, they also try to reduce the weight around five to six kg for these patients. As they mentioned that even by reducing this five to six kg of the weight, this also can improve their respiratory, cardiac, diabetic, and other metabolic syndromes. So it is better to make these patients more optimized. So the prehabilitation is again a choice. Like in, uh, don't know, in Pakistan, still we, the centers we have are prehabilitation. Because these are the drugs, uh, the most important for the anesthetist it gives a challenge that which drug should be given because these patients have very big volume distribution, lipid solubility and protein uh, binding. And also there are other factors like uh, liver is many times is infiltrated by the fat. So we don't know the real and the function of the liver. So the drug elimination and all these uh, distribution of the drug is unpredictable. So that's why some of the drugs we use on total body weight and for the rest of the drugs, which is on the right side, this is for the, that we should use the lean body weight. So what is the lean body weight? Lean body weight is the body, the weight of the muscles and other organs minus the fat. And total body weight is complete, the, including the fat. And the other, we also use the uh, average body weight or the, uh, we can use, because in that we know that uh, our adjustable body weight, where we put around 20 to 40% of the fat included in that. So the dosing is different for that. So the uh, for the loading propofol, we should take the total body weight because the, lipid soluble drug 
So initially, it actually distribute to all um, body and fat. Second, cis-hydrocarium and hydrocarium loading, we have to give on the total body weight and succinylcholine, again, volume of distribution, rig and midazolam, credited to the effect. And on the other side, if you are giving infusion of the propofol, like uh, sometimes we avoid the uh, initial agents in these patients. So we have to, when we are giving in the maintenance, so we have to uh, calculate the doses of these drugs on the lean body weight basis. And rest of the other opiates also, they should be on the lean body basis. So induction of anesthesia, and this is very important because now, for the induction of anesthesia, the most important is the airway management because the airway of these patients, they also not only give you the anatomical difficulty, but also the physiological difficulty because they cannot tolerate the longer period of apoxema or apnea because when we are difficult intubation or we are trying to intubate these patients, they cannot tolerate the longer area timings. So, obesity is associated with this uh, uh, difficulty in the airway. But only airway is not by obesity. So, obesity itself is not a, a very poor predictor. Uh, this is a predictor for the difficult intubation. But we have to assess the airway like we assess the airway for any other patients. Like Melampathy score 3, these are the difficult face mouth ventilation and intubation. Neck circumference more than 42 centimeter and BMI is more than 50. So these are the intubation predictor for both difficult intubation and mask ventilation. And the presence of a beard and symptoms of gastroesophageal reflex, these also cause the difficult airway and uh, also the large breast is also involved in this. That we should also assess these airway, not only that we think that obesity means difficult intubation. No, the difficult intubation also have the other parameters and we should take in account other parameters for that. So this is the position actually for the intubation, which is called HELP. HELP is at elevated laryngoscopic position. Actually, what do we in this position? You can see that in the first area that the uh, sternum and the uh, external auditory meatus are not in the horizontal plane. So that's why in this condition, the difficulty of intubation is very high. So we have to make this position for these patients by actually putting this wedge on the uh, also shoulder and on the eye. So in this manner, now you can see that the tragus are the uh, external auditory meatus and the sternum is on the horizontal plane. So we have the, some of the centers, they have a special wedge for these patients, but actually we can put the uh, blankets, roll of the blankets to just make this position. So this position has the advantage that it increases the comfort for the patient because lying flat also uh, breathing for the patient is difficult for this. Functional residual capacity is maintained. So we by this we can also, uh, we can prolong the apnea time and the reduced dyspnea and back mask ventilation is facilitated and laryngoscopy is improved. So this is again for the difficult intubation or for anticipated difficult intubation. You can see that if we cannot actually mask ventilate these patients, so we have a, another maneuver there which is called four-ended technique. So you can see from this picture that four ends are actually uh, are incorporated or in action for the ventilation of this patient. We can put the oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways. We can give, actually this is for the ambubic, but we can, with the circuit, we can give CPAP to these patients around 10 to 50 centimeter. So, apneic oxygenation and eye flow, nasal cannula oxygenation is also there to increase the apneic time and reduce peak airway pressures and reduce alveolar and arterial oxygen differences. So actually, this is the proper uh, position of these patients and many of the hospitals where the frequency of these surgeries are very high. So they have this special table for these bariatric surgeries. So this is for adequate immobilization. Arms and uh, feet are actually supported in this manner because we are doing this uh, uh, with the reverse tunnel position. So with this uh, position, we actually can do these strainings so the patient cannot fall and this cannot move down. 
So these are the best position for the bariatric procedure. Even the bariatric surgeon also do their surgeries in the same position. So again, in the OT, this is the position of the patient. So this is a 30 degree add up. And so, as I mentioned that there are, when we are intubating these patients, the opening period is actually, it is reduced in these patients. So we have to give apneic oxygenation. So apneic oxygenation, there are different methods. One method is this, that during intubation, we have to continue the oxygenation. We have to put a nasal uh, airway and with the nasal airway around 10 liter per minute of oxygen should be given, which is called insufflation. So this is the uh, passive insufflation. We are not ventilated. We are into, we are trying to do the laryngoscopy, but during the laryngoscopy, we are also giving oxygen to these patients, which is called apneic oxygenation. So safe apnea period, this is the SEP. It is time between paralysis and apnea until SPO2 drops to potentially critical level. So in if the patient is normal weight, like we do it normally daily with the normal weight patients, so the apnea time is around eight to 10 minutes and even without pre-oxygenation. So what happens to these patients, the apnea time is only two to three minutes. So if there's any difficulty in intubating the patient, so these patients will be completely uh, uh, apoxic and they come to the critical level of apoxemia. So how we can improve this situation, that is the SEP technique, as I mentioned before, apneic oxygenation by diffusion as we put the nasal uh, airway and then 10 liters of the oxygen is given by the uh, insufflation. And second procedure is called thrive. Thrive is transnasal humidified rapid insufflation and ventilatory exchange. We do it with the high flow nasal cannula. Nowadays, a lot of hospitals we have, and after COVID, even the small hospitals also have this uh, high flow nasal cannula. So we have to blend it. So 70% of the oxygen we can give to these. And also with this uh, high flow nasal cannula, we can give the CPAP of 10 to 12 centimeter of water. So this is actually we thrive and how this will improve. So nowadays, all the centers, they have the this uh, blender or the high flow nasal cannula uh, devices. So laryngoscopy and difficult intubation. BMI, is, as I mentioned, is not a powerful predictive of difficult laryngoscopy and intubation. So Bellampati class, more than three potential difficult intubation. And neck, circumference, if it is more than 40 centimeter, many studies have come that difficulty is around 5%. And if the neck circumference is more than 35%, so uh, uh, more than 50 centimeter, so the difficulty is around 35%. So this is very predictable. Uh, feature that which we can tell us that how we have to intubate these patients. Short neck and significant pharyngeal and pretracheal soft tissues and large breasts, these are actually causing their difficulty in intubation. So what are the intraoperative monitors? Again, there are, are like a series of diseases which are associated with the obesity. But it is not necessarily that all the patients have all the diseases at the same time. So our monitoring will also be directed to the disease which is involved. Like if the patient is more cardiac patient, more cardiac disease is there. So we have to go for more invasive monitoring for those patients for managing appropriately for the cardiac problems. But if the patient is respiratory, so we have to go for the more respiratory related in uh, this monitoring. So the invasive monitors are only uh, reserved for the patients who have uh, more than three comorbids and where the very extensive surgery is doing because sometimes when we are doing the this row and why uh, surgeries sometimes take sometimes four or to five hours. So if the patient has also comorbids and at the same time the surgery is extensive, so then it actually uh, drives us for the invasive monitoring. Otherwise, the ASA normal monitoring is there. In these patients, the other monitoring, this is again, many centers don't have the uh, bispectral index uh, monitoring, which is actually show you how uh, whether the patient is aware during anesthesia or not. Because as I mentioned, the drug uh, management is unpredictable in these patients. 
So many times, even with the adequate amount of drug, we cannot say that the patient is fully anesthetized. So this monitoring is a good uh, 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 monitor to just show you that whether the patient is awake or is just uh, adequately sedated. So these patients, the second most important is how to ventilate these patients. As I've mentioned that because of the restrictive lung disease and this on the spine position, actually the FRC and the lung volumes reduce further. And when we give the anesthesia, so it worsens the situation. Uh, actually, Nayab, you are playing with my uh, presentation. Can you please stop this? Uh, the strategies to keep the normocapnia and acceptable airway pressures. So no mode is actually superior. We can use the volume control and we can use the pressure control. And nowadays, in most of the anesthesia machines, they, we have the, all the modes. Previously, actually, we had only one mode that was volume control, but now our machines also have the uh, volume control and pressure control, but no mode is superior. Our actually aim is to keep the patient normocapnic and with the acceptable airway pressures. So we have to uh, use the, like for ARDS, we also, because ARDS is also restrictive lung disease air, we also use the protective lung protocols like cardio volume of six to seven ml per kg with the RDL body weight, not with the uh, uh, total body weight. Okay, so it is not total body weight, it is the ideal body weight and six to eight ml per kg. Second, we have to keep the SpO2 acceptable is 90, 92%. We don't have to give more oxygen or more ventilator because that have more uh, derangements in the respiratory system for uh, uh, getting the under percent saturation. So for us, the acceptable is 90% and plateau pressure should be less than 30 centimeter of water. Or you can use the PIP or the peak inspiratory pressure that should be less than 40. So because these patients, as I mentioned that on the lying position, their actually lungs are because diaphragm and all the abdominal uh, organs, they push the diaphragm upward. So there's a basal atelectasis in these patients. So we have to keep a peep of five to 10 centimeter for these patients. Although the higher peeps can decrease the blood pressure. So we have to keep the blood uh, peep for the saturation of 90%. So lung recruitment maneuvers also before the extubation, because many times when the patient comes on this spontaneously, we actually leave the patient at that time because patient is still with the uh, residual anesthesia and patient is lying. So at that time, again, uh, and with the PEEP, which you have already given during the surgery is also lost when we have if the patient is start uh, uh, spontaneous breathing. So at that time, before extubation, we should manually give a uh, large volume, uh, tidal volume uh, breaths to just open the and uh, recruit the lungs before extubation. So this is actually the whole method. I don't know why this uh, markings are to be clean. Anyhow. It can only be clean so by Nayab who has done it. So uh, Nayab, yeah, done it, you but, can uh, kindly erase I cannot, it. Yeah. It's okay, so Dr. Second, Anjit, the you most can important it. management during anesthesia is that intraoperative fluid management because we have to give fluid management according to the total body weight, ideal body weight. So we can't know that. So that's why we have to be goal directed fluid therapy. Many times, as we all know that during laparoscopy, urine output is also unpredictable because of the laparoscopy surgery, it also increased the pressure and that pressure reduced the renal perfusion. So during laparoscopy, urine output is not a good indicator for the proper fluid management. So we have to optimize it by goal directed and we have to know that what is the NPO time of these patients and then the other parameters like heart rate and blood pressure we should uh, take in account. So we have to go for the restricted fluid therapy rather than liberal. So there is also a study for the liberal or restrictive fluid management during elective surgery or systemic review and meta-analysis. So this is what compared with the 
uh, with this both. So in the liberal, actually they have given 10 ml per kg of the uh, fluids and in the restricted, they restrict the fluid to 4 ml per kg. So in the end, they have actually found out that there's no difference between the two uh, group of the patients. So we have to go for the restrictive type of uh, fluid therapy because many times we don't know the overt uh, uh, heart failure of these patients. As these patients, because of continuous or fluid uh, overload, they have concentric or eccentric uh, cardiac failures and diastolic and diastolic, uh, systolic dysfunctions. So we have to be very much uh, careful about the fluid therapy. So we have to be on uh, fluid therapy should be again on the lean body weight rather than total body weight and restrictive is preferred than the liberal. So don't go for the only urine output as an indicator for the fluid. So the other, now we have to actually go for the post-operative care of these patients. Post-operatively, the most important is the pain, PUNV, respiratory support, early mobilization, and psychological support. As I mentioned that we have to be very careful for the pain control of these patients. So we, on the, in the recovery room, the close monitoring of cardiac and respiratory functions should be continued and reversal should be adequate. Before extubation, patients should be awake, alert, and able to sustain our air lift for five seconds as we do for any other, but we should be more uh, be meticulous for these patients. I follow up actually supplemental oxygen is recommended. Patients should be in semi-recumbent or sitting position so as to add spontaneous respiration. So 30 degree, actually we do the add up position for these patients. And we have to, and in recovery room, we have to be very careful and watch these patients because these patients can be go in any times uh, like they, uh, there's need for the reintubation or need for the uh, supplemental oxygen and there's need for other uh, problems. So we have to be watchful even when they are in the recovery room. So if the patient is post-operative pulmonary complication, and nausea vomiting, thromboembolism, post-operative analgesia, PECU protocols, and an astomatic leak. Sometimes even they are doing the surgery, especially with a, a sleeve gastrectomy, they have the very co commonly the, the complications which actually appears within four to six hours is the anastomatic leak. So we have to be watchful and even the surgeons are also watchful and our, we have to direct our nursing staff for these complications. So the recovery should be also again in the 30 degree or 45 add up position. CPAP started in the early post operative may announce recovery or normal respiratory function. If we are not started it preoperatively, we have to just keep it on the bedside that may patient may need this again. And sometimes even the patients have their CPAP at home. So if they have CPAP at home, we should actually advise those patients to come with the CPAP they may need the CPAP post-operatively and most of the time they need it. The patients who have already are uh, pre-operatively on the CPAP, post-operatively, deliberately, they need this CPAP. So for the post-operative nausea vomiting, again, we have to go for the multi-modal approach. As I mentioned before, there are some studies that single drug is not that much effective. So we have to go for the double drug regime or triple drug regime. And the most importantly, and there are some studies which I've done for the triple regime, and that is actually, they have combined the dexamethasone, uh, ontinesterone, and the alveridol. And it was actually superb as compared to other triple regimes or triple regimes. Dexamethasone, only if you are giving the dexamethasone, it's also have a very favorable uh, response in these patients by decreasing their stress response, and also they uh, decrease the length of stay. So the recommended dose for this is around, we actually average give four milligram IV 90 minutes prior to surgery. So this also prevent the post-operative nausea vomiting in the post-operative period. And this is actually the study which is done. 
like uh, where the combination of aliprodol, dexa, and ondansetron for prevention of post-operative nausea and vomiting in laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy. So it was a randomized double-blind trial, and they have come up with the this uh, conclusion that this is actually superior to any other regime. For multimodal analgesia, it is important that simultaneous administration of two or more analgesic agents targeting pain pathways as various levels. So multimodal analgesia is again our target and we should go for the multimodal analgesia. So in multimodal analgesia, as we know that the, there's a very altered uh, drug metabolism. Second, the opioids, have more, they are more sensitive to the opioid response for the obstructive sleep apnea. So we have to go for the multimodal analgesia and we have to reduce the analgesic uh, dose of the opioids. So we can use IV paracetamol and short acting and NSAIDs. Again, these are not uh, uh, protocols for every patient because sometimes uh, NSAIDs are not given to the patients who are have already like a renal disease or maybe they have a, a gastritis or gastric problems. And third, if the surgery is sleep gastrectomy, because in their surgery, the chance of bleeding is high. So we have to avoid the NSAIDs in those patients, but we can give IV paracetamol and we can combine the paracetamol with the low energetic dose of the ketamine Dexamethasone is there, and nowadays dexmetodomidine is again is a very good drug. It's analgesic and sedative, and sedation is not to the level that uh, impairs the uh, causes the sleep apnea or worse the sleep apnea. Actually, for these procedures, if it is open, we can use the epidural or the other. But uh, if it is a uh, laparoscopic, so in laparoscopic the uh, Analgesia, the original analgesia is not that much effective, but we can give uh, like local on the area of uh, incisional or the areas of the ports, we can put uh, local anesthesia on the ports. For thromboembolism, actually the complication is very high in these patients and around 50% of mortality after bariatric surgery. So the risk factors for this is like obesity itself, if there's a patient history of already uh, uh, thrombosis or v, uh, VT or increased age, smoking, heart failure, respiratory failure, and OSA. So these patients are high risk for thromboembolic uh, phenomena and uh, incidents are high in these patients. So we have to also give the prophylaxis for these patients. And again, uh, prophylaxis, thromboprophylaxis is mechanical. In mechanical, we have the pneumatic compression devices, graduated compression stockings, early mobilization is there, and cough length compression stockings. And in the pharmacological, we have actually important is the low molecular weight heparin. The advantage is more predictable dose, high bioavailability, high plasma of life. That's why we give in the once a daily, reduce the heparin induced side effects, like in when we are giving the Heparin, even with the single dose, there is a chance of thrombocytopenia or hit, which is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So in these patients, we when we are giving, uh, giving the lower molecular weight heparin, this is more favorable. And the dose is, again, people are using it 40 per day and morbidly obese. If it is more than 40, then 60 milligram of clexane is adequate for this patient once a day. So what are the decisions when we are we have to take this patient to PECO or we should transfer this patient to HDO or ICU? So these are the actually the indications like gastric bypass surgery, go and why, which is extensive surgery for more than four hours and comorbids again are involved with their male gender, BMI is more than 40 and age more than 50 years old, confirmed diagnosis of OSA, and significant medical or surgical comorbidities and previous abdominal surgery. Actually, Dr. Amit, we have one hour. To, yeah, thank you. Okay, this is conclusion. Okay, we are concluding this uh, session on this lecture. We have to take preoperative, postoperative, and intraoperative. These measures, like in preoperative, multidisciplinary patient assessment is there, and in multidisciplinary, it is anesthetist, bariatric surgeon, physicians, all, even the nurses. Together they sit and then they plan the procedures. Screening for OSA and OHS, scoring for risk stratification, and plan post-operative pathway preoperatively. This is very important that preoperatively we should 
decide what we are going to do in post operative. Post operative again, three, 30 degree proper position, multimodal analgesia to reduce the dose of the opiates, CPAP or iClo nasal cannula for selected patients only. Okay, and uh, treat the anti well, this uh, PNV with the combination of antimedics rather than single drugs, physio and early mobilization. And intraoperatively, as I mentioned, this is most important is the monitoring and the judicious fluid therapy. Thank you so much, Dr. Amjad, for such an extensive uh, talk on bariatric surgeries. It was an eye opener for most of the other uh, residents and participants who usually don't uh, do these kind of surgeries on daily basis. Uh, and obviously, th this is something which is a specialized field, so not everyone is acquainted with it. So now I would request the participants to kindly ask questions either on the chat box or directly with Dr. Amjit so that uh, we can uh, proceed further with this session. Uh, Ma'am, I have one question. Indeed, yes, please yes. proceed. Uh, uh, according to Society of Bariatric Anesthesia UK, uh, the uh, muscle relaxants are given according to lean body mass because they have a low uh, volume of distribution. Actually, so what is your... It is uh, mentioned so what... for... Uh, yes, uh, actually, which drugs? The muscle relaxant is uh, like cis or atracarium. Are uh, are no, These are actually... The metabolism is different. And for vecronium and rocronium, this is actually for the lean body mass. And again, for cis atracarium and atracarium, if we are going the loading dose, it is total body weight. But if you are using it for the maintenance, like in ICU or for maintenance, like infusion, so we have to give them lean body mass. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you. So, so, uh, Doctor Tayeb, would uh, would you like to um uh, ask something pertinent to it when you were asking about the lean body weight or the uh, muscle relaxant in particular to uh, the obesity? Uh, uh yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, according to uh, 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 for for obesity, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, I I could not understand according to loading dose uh, and uh, maintenance dose. Like in because sometimes like you do. Yes, uh, yes, you, please, please, you tell me. Yes, sometimes we do uh, intubations using uh, non depolarizing muscle relaxants. You mean we should give dose according to total body weight at this that time? Yeah, actually, we are using two drugs mostly for the intubation one is the saxamethonium, and second is the rocronium. And for rocronium, if we don't have the sugamidex, that it is mentioned that we should not go for the rocronium because we cannot reverse it if we could not pay, uh, intubate the patient. So sex is the only option for us. So for sex, it is categorically mentioned that we should give it for the total body weight rather than lead body mass. Okay, sir. Uh, so is 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 your uh, uh, is your query clarified? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Okay, so there is uh, one question on the chat box from Arbab Jahangir and uh, uh, he has asked what will be the dose of reversal either according to the total body weight or lean body weight? And the second question is how can we apply for e certificate? Okay, that question is for us. So I think they are, uh, he or she is uh, participating for the first time. So Dr. Amjit, can you please uh, answer the first question which is the dose of reversal? Actually, dose of reversal is if we are using the sugamidex, it is the same as for the total body weight. But if we are using the reversal for the same, we are not going to change the dose. We, same like total body weight, whereas we are giving the, uh, sorry, lean body weight, which we are using it. Actually, there is a comp uh, compl uh, confusion about the lean body mass and adjusted body actually mass because in adjusted we have to contribute 30 to 40 percent of the fat because lean body mass is uh, uh, only free from the fat it is only uh, muscles and it is bones and uh, the organs so we should go for the adjusted body weight so the drugs is better to go adjusted and secondly they have mentioned that always go for titratable doses because even many studies, they have not come with any conclusion to give the final word. So the final word they say should go for the 
tapering and so go slowly and go for the response. See the, what is the response is like even for the midazolam, they say as per response, you have to increase the dose. So many times we can't say that this is the only dose which we have to give. So see the response, if the response, and again, the for the reversal, it is mentioned, and it is even uh, indicated that we should use the neuromuscular monitoring for those. And so we have to reverse the patient according to the monitor rather than just by the uh, as a crude, mostly we do it. So we have to, for these patients, especially the morbidly obese patient, we should use the neuromuscular monitors and we should reverse it according to the monitor as it is directed by the monitor. Okay, so Dr. Amjit, there is another question uh, that uh, what is the what what is the uh, indication or what about the use of supraglottic devices in morbidly obese patients? Use of like for uh, use of supraglottic devices in obese patients. Yeah, actually, we are using we uh, again. This is a not that supraglottic. One of the complication with the supraglottic is that we cannot prevent the aspiration in these patients. Like if the patient is coming for gastric surgery, for all the surgery, we have to intubate the patient. If we could not intubate the patient, so as a just alternate device, we can use the supraglottic devices and it should be ND with us because uh, as this is actually a very vast field and uh, we have to mention this, the difficult intubation trolley should be on in our side. So we have should uh, have the so, uh, this uh, supraglottic devices handy with us that if we could not intubate the patient and patient is going to be desaturate, so we can use the supraglottic devices. What we uh, for the surgery procedures, as electively, we should think, uh, see that if the patient have a ST of S, uh, GRD, then we should not use them. But if there's a small procedures uh, for some other procedure other than bariatric surgery, so we can use the supraglottic devices if the patient don't have uh, like a aortic hernia or the other contraindications for even for the normal patient. Uh, but at times, we also need a larger size of uh, the supraglottic device, either used as LMA or IGEL. And most of the times, it's not available the size of five or, you know, uh, greater than that. So that's yeah, also again, one of the yes, limitations. Th that's why the preoperative assessment is very much important because we should know the mouth opening, the size of the tongue, because many patients, they have a large size tongue. Even tomorrow, I also have in my list, there's a morbidly obese patient for coming for hysterectomy. I have assessed the airway. The airway was very much like easy. It, I'm expecting, anticipating intubation one, but again, with the intub uh, anticipation of in, uh, intubation one, I'm also going to prepare all the difficult intubation devices and uh, difficult intubation trolley will be on my side. Okay. Any other questions? So we also have our senior uh, anesthesiologist and uh, faculty member from the online lecture series, Dr. Arshad Taki is also with us. Uh, Dr. Arshad, do you have any comments or would you like to say a few words on this topic? And to Dr. Amjad. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for asking me. I apologize. I joined late because I somehow I missed the, uh, or I did not see the link. Prob no, I must have missed someone. But uh, whatever I gathered, it was a great uh, presentation. Regarding this, the issue of supraglottic devices, I just have a little comment that when we, uh, we uh, when we're using supraglottic devices, we need to keep in mind that the the morbidly obese have a low chest wall compliance, so we are likely to uh, to require higher inflation pressures. So that's where the, the issue of seal becomes even ever so more important because getting that uh, in order to get a proper seal, you may require higher pressures or effective or vent effective ventilation. Uh, so that's 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 my concern that uh, you are going to require higher higher in, uh, inflation pressures in order to get uh, get effective ventilation in these patients, uh, and so you require require. A good seal. So, so basically, uh, it's quite uh, evident yeah. uh, from uh, whatever yeah. Doctor Amjad and you have also, you know, gave, gave us the importance of. Uh, 
uh, that in case of emergency, when the intubation is required for the bariatric surgeries, and usually the sur these kind of surgeries are elective surgeries. So in case of an emergency, uh, not the true emergency, but the emergency which is happening at the time of intubation, uh, as per the DAS protocol or the Difficult Airway Society protocol, uh, an LMA can be inserted in a patient or a supraglottic device can be inserted in a patient to save the life of the patient. But for the bariatric surgery itself, uh, the uh, these are the contraindications uh, like the surgery cannot proceed with an LMA in, in, in tube. So in the, such kind of patients, we have to make the patient awaken and then we have to wait and then we have to you know, get the, all the organization done for the difficult airway and intubation later on, either to postpone or either discuss with the surgeon or you know proceed with something else instead of the LMA itself. Yes, exactly the same. And thank you, Dr. Sadki, for your valid and for nice comments. Uh, and and one, one more, a little comment on the muscle relaxants. Yeah, uh, the standard teaching, of course, is that uh, since the muscle relaxants are water soluble, quaternary amount, uh, um, uh, I means. So we, uh, the general standard teaching is that you give le uh, lean body weight or as uh, Dr. Um, Amjad has rightly pointed out adjusted body weight. I think when we when we talk about uh, the, these kind of uh, predefined doses, as Dr. Amjad has rightly pointed out once again, that uh, when we talk about this, uh, given a predefined dose, we are looking at a rather simplistic version of uh, human physiology. Yes, they, these are principles that need to be kept in mind, the fact of water solubility, volume of distribution, and that forms the basis. But you remember, the, these are compartment models built on observations. Uh, an individual patient may actually require more or less than what we the, 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 the standard dosing regime suggests, and you should actually monitor and adjust your doses accordingly. That's where the, the era of individualized medicine is taking us these days. Uh, I hope I have made the point yeah. clear. Yes, thank you so very much, Dr. Asher. It was such a valid point and you have rightly mentioned it. So uh, any other comments from the, or the uh, questions from the participants are most welcome. Otherwise we are ahead of time and I would, uh, like to thank Dr. Ashad for joining us, even late, but your your presence matters a lot, sir. And thank you so much, Dr. Amjad. Uh, it was a really thank nice you. and elaborative talk on uh, the bariatric surgeries, including all the modalities which are being used. So I'm really grateful to uh, all the participants. I would also request the participants to kindly fill in the feedback form so that they can get the e-certificates within a week's or two weeks time period. So thank you so much, Dr. Ashad, and thank you so much, Dr. Amjad. Uh, for joining us thank today you. for the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.